Thank you very much for coming and uh, in your uh, busy research and uh, uh, working uh, schedule. So I'm going to give a talk uh, for those on neural networks and then once you get into details you can see uh, sort of my background in uh, evolutionary computation. It's a lot to do with that word uh, in terms of ensemble because all evolutionary computation work is a concept of population. So in neural network domain, very few people using the word of population, but they do use the word of ensemble, means that it's not a single neural network, it's a several different uh, neural networks. So what I'm going to do uh, for this uh, is go through uh, primarily only three points. Uh, one is the uh, motivation. And for this motivation, I'll actually explain how someone who has been interested in evolutionary computation got interested in ensemble learning, what's the link between the two. And then I'll describe uh, a basic idea, actually a very straightforward idea. I hesitate for quite a long time whether I talk about this basic idea because it's so simple and I sometimes kind of embarrassing. If I thought I'd embarrass myself so many times already uh, in front of students, others, but I don't mind anymore. And the last part uh, are the set of algorithms uh, we have developed uh, centered around those basic ideas. Uh, they might have some details, but I don't think they're very important um, unless you are really into this particular field. Then you do want to know the details. Uh, otherwise, I, I hope everyone can sort of uh, go out of this room and understand the first two points, uh, one is motivation, uh, the other one is basic idea. I hope that can be uh, applied in some other areas uh, as well. Okay, uh, for the very first part, in terms of uh, motivations. So, what is ensemble? So, in my case, ensemble just indicates a collection of learning systems. Uh, what kind of learning systems? Those so the learning systems are, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in my case, uh, a single learning system is one single artificial neural network. But if you look at the literature more widely, uh, people have used uh, uh, quasi-logic rules in terms of the rule-based system. You could use uh, decision trees there, uh, you could use something like a support vector machines. So concept of ensemble is not limited to artificial neural networks, although I'll be looking at uh, neural network ensembles. Uh, second point, actually quite important to know in the beginning, is uh, there have been quite a lot of studies uh, from a very different uh, perspective, uh, for statisticians, uh, for computer scientists, for machine learning people, uh, from uh, people in educational computation as well, all looking at different aspects of ensemble learning. And the last part really explains why I'm so interested in that. Thank you. Yeah, why I'm interested in uh, evolving artificial neural networks rather than evolving uh, other, other learning systems. It's a very sort of naive motivation that uh, so we all have a biological neural network, and for most of us, we believe uh, it's an evolutionary process drive that rather than other things. Okay. So it's certainly quite interesting. Say, if we do end up with a biological system, like biological brains we have, uh, there must be some principles behind it. Okay. It's not entirely random. Okay. It's not designed. So what are those principles? Whether we can learn from those principles, and that would be nice to at least inspired by those principles in designing new computing systems. So that really explains uh, why I introduced evolution in this, uh, uh, in this talk so early. It's my belief that uh, learning and evolution are really two fundamental forms of adaptation, uh, either in the nature or in artificial systems. Now, not the same thing, uh, although we mix them quite often, uh, because learning we often associate with uh, one single individual. Over time, you improve the performance okay, according to certain 
certain uh, criteria. Uh, for evolution, there's always a notion of a collection of individuals who improve the average performance of a collection over generations. It's a little bit like a sort of a human evolution at the sort of a larger scale of a population, but individually, everyone learns. Okay? Different people learn uh, different pace, uh, different capacity. capacity. So we're quite interested in actually integrating these two in artificial systems. So that's the motivation behind the evolving uh, artificial neural networks. If you look at the details um, in the artificial domain, evolving neural networks, there's actually been a huge amount of work using an uh, evolutionary approach in uh, learning, designing, and evolving neural networks. So, there are some straightforward using an evolutionary approach to adjust the weights of artificial neural networks, especially for recurrent networks where that application or any gradient descent algorithm might not work that well. Uh, slightly more interesting work is to use an uh, evolutionary approach in designing the structure of an artificial neural network. And that's something which is quite hard to apply any gradient design the algorithm because you have a combinatorial space and every single individual is more likely to wrap it and the weight of the graph in the space. So gradients in a continuous sense is impossible to calculate. So in that case, evolutionary approach actually has a certain advantage in doing that. And the last part is actually, I think, the opportunity for those people who are into this area is that in the learning process, the basic learning rules could actually also change. Maybe this is sort of a, a learning rules, um, especially uh, these sort of fundamental rules, would normally presume to be fixed uh, either, in, uh, either in evolutionary uh, learning or in evolutionary uh, computation. But in reality, you know, if you look at the biological world, they're actually not fixed. They can actually change themselves. And the evolution approach could actually incorporate this relatively easily in comparison with other methods. So that's one slice uh, overview at a very broad area uh, in terms of combining evolution with uh, learning. So just to talk about evolutional computation, uh, I use one slide uh, to summarize what I meant when I say it's evolution approach or evolutionary computation. Uh, my working definition for evolutional computation is really looking at uh, computational systems that uh, get inspirations from natural evolution. So it's quite different from uh, some other subfields where they are very interested in using computational approach to build biological models. So that's entirely different things. So uh, I'm not building anything which tries to reflect the biological world. Instead, I try to borrow some ideas from the biological world. So one of the ideas is actually survival of the fittest. So let's give you an example to see how tricky that sort of analogy to biology is. It's really stayed to that very crude level. Um, if you look at the evolutional computation slightly more in terms of how it can be used, uh, why it's relevant to me, uh, it can be relevant if you're interested in optimization or interested in machine learning or interested in design. So those tend to be three areas evolutional computation has been used uh, quite a lot. I put emphasis there, uh, just like to emphasize that uh, uh, evolutional computation, not just a genetic algorithm, also a genetic algorithm is actually a major part of evolutional computation. So we should actually regard these two all the same, otherwise it miss a lot of interesting uh, bit. Uh, the last point, I just want to emphasize uh, 10 or even 20 years ago, uh, whenever you mention this uh, evolutionary algorithm, you get two questions. One question is uh, how can a random algorithm possibly work? And it's random. Right? So I think those kind of questions uh, sort of disappear very quickly because people understand that just stochastic algorithm can be very powerful. Uh, the other typical question is that uh, yes, you demonstrate a lot of very interesting results. Some, sometimes actually the best results so far in solving particular problems. But can you give me any guarantees, what's the theory behind it, to explain why this actually should be working? Uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a lot more progress than the previous decades in terms of theoretical work. So I just want to 
uh, give you a bit more confidence that uh, it's not just a purely empirical work, and there's a lot of like, uh, there's a lot of theoretical work as well. Coming back to this particular talk, and then I'm sort of step by step drilling down into this uh, evolutionary learning. So this slide actually summarizes uh, the current practice at a very high level of abstraction, what's going on. Uh, so whenever you talk about uh, evolutionary learning, so this sort of conceptual diagram captures is a high level structure. So we always have a population of learning system in evolutionary learning. So that's a very important concept. In my case, every single individual here is represented by one artificial neural network. Once we have this set of artificial neural networks, and then we want to evaluate how good they are. So we have some kind of notion in terms of fitness. So we evaluate the fitness. Once we have this fitness, and then we can do so-called artificial selection. So this artificial selection is really say, for a good artificial neural network, I'm going to select it as a parent with a higher probability. Okay, so it's a custom process, but there's a very strong bias towards good individuals. So the population drawer here, they are parents. So those parents actually selected from this uh, set of populations. They can be one individuals select multiple times because the thing is so high. So once you get these parents, and then you can go through these so-called uh, uh, genetic operations to generate offspring, so, and the offspring replace the parent. So you go through these sort of cycles for many iterations. You can imagine because of this uh, <coughs> selection process, every time you only select good neural networks to survive, the poor one just dies out from the population. Every time you have this kind of stochastic process, that's also operators. So the objective with operators is to generate new solutions in the hope you are more likely to get a better solution. Okay? There's no guarantee because this is stochastic selection, this is stochastic operator. But for realistically, you hope you get a better one and a better solution. So if you iterate many times, and then you can just imagine the average performance according to the fitness measure here will be improved. If not improving, those individuals will be thrown out of the population anyway. So no matter what you do in terms of uh, current papers, when you read it, uh, behind it is the cycle. So one interesting part, uh, in the early days, which was uh, somewhat overlooked, uh, is this fitness evaluation. So if we consider a very simple case in terms of supervised learning. So normally the task is uh, we have a set of historical data uh, with labels as well in the output, and then we want to train a particular machine, learning machine like neural networks, such that this neural network has some kind of uh, prediction capability. If you give a new input to this neural network, it will predict the correct output. <coughs> So that capability is captured by generalization. So you want to maximize that generalization. Uh, what can you do uh, in order to achieve that? Well, you can say, I want to minimize this training error which I measured on the historical data. That's the only data you have. You don't know the future. Okay? So nobody knows the future. Uh, obviously, that's not a very good method uh, if the data we collected contains noise. If I say, I come up with uh, this wonderful algorithm and I minimize this error to be zero, uh, you, you must have overfitted to that data, not only the underlying concept, also the noise, uh, which is bad. Uh, what we want to do is to learn the underlying concept and then forget uh, all these noise. It's very easy to say, it's very difficult to do, because in practice, nobody is going to tell you what's the level of the noise or what kind of noise you have. Uh, so in machine learning theory, it says that in order to consider this kind of error, we must consider some kind of regularization as well. So that's one way to sort of get, get, get this uh, no, noise away from, from the system. If we quantify this a little bit, try to generate some kind of cost function or fitness function, 
So the fitness function is always inversely proportional to error. That means that the larger the error, the lower the fitness. We don't want a large error. But at the same time, this regularization is often reflected by some kind of complexity. So you want a simple neural network which correctly classifies something if you're looking at a supervisor. You don't want a complex system which are more likely to overfit the data. Okay. So in actual implementation, this complexity can be a simple count into the how many ways you have in the neural network. So you can say, I want to minimize the error generated by this neural network. I also want to minimize the number of ways within this neural network. So the heuristic behind this is actually the old kinds of ways are uh, given two learning systems which both describe a training data equally well for the training data, you always prefer the simpler one because it's more likely to generalize well for future data. It's not a theorem, it's a heuristic. And that's the heuristic we use here. I don't know, this is crazy. <laughs> Okay, so here's one slide I hope you will remember. Uh, so it's interesting, I said so much so far. Uh, all those are some kind of uh, introduction. So I make a claim, try to distinguish between evolutionary learning and optimization. Uh, that word evolutionary is actually quite important here. Uh, it's very obvious. Uh, Learning has often been formulated as uh, optimization problems, and sometimes in order to encourage more discussion and debate, I make a more outrageous claim that uh, learning has always been formulated as optimization problem. And then I can ask you to think of a learning problem which is not formulated as optimization. Yeah, just think about it, and then we, we can discuss this. Um, it took me a very, very long time, as Castillo said, it's very hard or impossible to think of a machine learning problem which not eventually formulated as optimization. You can start with simple examples like a web application. It's not nothing to do with learning, it's just great to design the minimization algorithm of mean square error. When people invented a fast prop, quick prop, it's nothing to do with learning. It's using a second order information to minimize error function. The key part is actually defining that error function or cost function. So all the algorithm you regard as a learning algorithm is actually some kind of optimization. Okay. However, we, we know by now learning is very different from optimization. The objective learning is try to perform well in the future, try to perform well in an unknown environment. In a known environment, I'm sure you can figure out what to do. Okay, so you can come up with some kind of optimal response. So in optimization, the fitness function we use uh, reflect exactly what's needed. So if I want to maximize the value, y is better than 0 0.99, so there's no ambiguity there. In learning, uh, we want to maximize generalization. However, uh, quantify generalization precisely in practice is impossible. Okay, you can't predict the future exactly. So you can estimate it. If you estimate it, and this previous diagram, uh, whatever people do, uh, this step becomes uh, extremely questionable because uh, what this evolutionary process says is that uh, we can use this cycle to find the best learning system according to the fitness function. Okay, so that's best. So what I'm arguing. Um, in this slide is because impossible to quantify this generalization ability precisely in practice, that fitness function is not the same as exactly what you want. So if you come up with the best individual according to that fitness function, it does not mean it's really the best. Okay. So I always use the example I have you in a university environment. So I'm very interested in having good PhD student to work on a research project, very interesting. So what kind of information you can get in evaluating undergraduates in terms of applications to a PhD program? 
In most cases, you look at undergraduate marks. So what this sentence says, the student with the highest mark in a bachelor's or master's program might not be the best PhD student in the future. And this is all it says. So when I gave that example, everybody said, of course, that's obvious. However, that's not what people actually implemented uh, in evolutionary learning. Okay? People implementing evolutionary learning is actually draw a very strong conclusion the highest mark in BSc and MSc equivalent to highest mark in PhD or some performance in PhD. Uh, by drawing this uh, simple observation, it's really to ask one question from now on is uh, we should abandon this practice of finding the best individual. Uh, that's because the best is not well defined. Uh, you probably wonder saying, well, surely this is not uh, the first time uh, people observe this. Uh, why, why you <coughs> emphasize uh, at this particular point? The reason we can emphasize at this point is for evolutionary learning, we always maintain a population of neural networks or learning systems. So if we don't put all our eggs into the best individual, we have the second best and the third best in the population anyway. If you use a classical machine learning approach, you look at the one learning system at a time. Whether you like it or not, that's the only one you have. Okay, there's no other choice. So this question probably won't occur. That's the only thing you have. In our case, if we do have a population, I think we should think rather differently on the traditional way of thinking in machine learning because we want to make use of the entire population rather than any single individual. So I actually said the survival of the fittest, which is very useful for optimization, is not quite sort of appropriate in terms of learning, just because of what I mentioned previously. So here's the link transition from uh, evolutionary learning into this ensemble learning. So we really should treat this population we used in evolutionary computation as an ensemble of learning machines, rather than say, he's the best one, he's the worst one, because the best and the worst were actually according to the historical data or training data. I don't have any mathematical proof to say if we treat population as an ensemble, it's definitely better than the sort of orthop, uh, sort of classical approach of selecting the best individual. But we can come up with some very simple experiments to do a controlled experiment. So what I'm going to do is to use the structure, overall framework, uh, as being used by everyone so the, in the field. The only difference is at the end of the evolution process, uh, most people will identify the best individual saying, here's the output of our system. What I will do is I will pick the entire final population, which includes the best individual, of course. And then I just think of some very easy combination method to say, I'm going to combine everything within this population into a single output. Okay, so that's the ensemble. So in terms of evolution process, it will be exactly the same. And there's no additional sort of efforts made there. The only difference is I look at this output differently. And rather than looking at this individual, I look at the whole population as one output. Um, So I'll skip over a few slides. Uh, there's a few slides just describing the experimental setup I used in terms of what kind of evolutionary algorithms I used in evolving neural networks. So in this case, I pick up some fairly well-known data sets, as an example, uh, on this slide. But in the actual study, there's over 20 different data sets used, some small, some large. Uh, for the evolutionary algorithm, when we apply to neural networks, uh, we apply it both in terms of uh, weight learning as well as structural changes. So we learn the structure as well as weight simultaneously. For each of these rows, there are two sub rows. And the first one indicates if I 
take the best performing individual out of the final population of this evolutionary process and then I evaluate the performance on a separate <coughs> testing data set in order to get indication or estimation of its generalization ability, how well it performed. So 0.1 basically said there's about 10%, not about like exactly 10% error when I tested on independent testing data set. So those test data set were never used in the training and the evolution process. So this ensemble performance is exactly what is described if I combine all the results within the final population, including this one as well, because of next time, I get error rate in this one is about 9.3%. So what do those numbers mean? Uh, those numbers are actually average according to the multiple trials. And the reason we need to do multiple trials is because uh, this evolutionary algorithm, a stochastic algorithm, you need to repeat many times and then in order to get some statistically sound result. Because you do this statistical sound approach, you can carry out some hypothesis test and then you can ask the question uh, whether these two numbers are really different statistically. So you can carry out a test and then out of the three data set, those two pairs, uh, there's actually six statistically significant difference. Uh, for the last pair, they were the same. The numbers are different, so this average of difference statistically, you cannot say anything. Which is very encouraging in a sense. This is out of exactly the same experiment. Okay? Uh, the only difference is how I look at this result. Uh, one particular point of view is to look at a so-called best individual the other one is saying, I don't want to put all my money onto the best individual, I want to look at the entire population, including the worst one. And I mean, this is a small set of problems, two out of three, you actually get significant performance boost out of it. So that's actually quite encouraging, and then uh, I borrowed one term to say, this is very similar to daily life where we say two heads are better than one. Right? Not always rely on any single uh, decision makers uh, we rely on. In this case, uh, we actually have uh, 20 individuals in, in the population, so it's been like 20 heads are better than one in this case. Uh, obviously, this is actually uh, the first step in terms of uh, experimental demonstration of this idea. It is indeed uh, a bit naive and uh, simplistic. So what we can do is to ask a follow-on question would be more interesting. Assuming we are going to use this ensemble approach in learning, so I'm going to abandon this approach to construct one wonderful learning system to perform tasks. It's too difficult to find one thing which is wonderful. It might be easier to find several things, each of them simpler, but in combination, they're actually quite powerful. How do I do it? So because research question changes slightly. Previously said, where is that wonderful learning system? Now the research question says, where is that wonderful team of learning systems? So it's a slightly different one. And that slightly different one is very much uh, leading to this question. If we buy into this uh, philosophy of having two tests better than one, how are we going to design all those neural networks? So you want the algorithm designed it, you don't want to sit there and design it. It's actually quite difficult to sit there and design it because uh, you want to consider individual's performance and you also want some kind of cooperation among different individuals so that you achieve the same goal. So in this case, uh, there, there is one thing which is very interesting here, uh, which is about the diversity. Um, this is a very straightforward given our sort of daily life experience. If we have a team of individuals try to perform a task, you know you are not going to get anything out of it if all of those individuals are exactly the same. Uh, I always use uh, one daily life example in terms of playing team sport, okay, whether it's basketball team or soccer team. Any sport team uh, where you need multiple players, you always need a diversity different roles among those players. Okay. 
Um, you, you never say that you'll ever go keep us um, into a football team. You can say, oh, I can pro protect my goal, you know, lying around. That doesn't help you in winning the game. And then having uh, 11 forward and front doesn't help you either. It's always diversity within the team to make the team performance better. I think uh, that's why I emphasize the research question to change slightly, you know, looking at the performance of the team. Uh, that question translates into the research field. It's very interesting because now you need to quantify what do you mean in terms of diversity. It's very easy to say in words, but if I want to design algorithms, I need something which is quantified. So what does diversity mean? So you can actually see uh, the, the whole set of papers actually try to define accurately what I mean by diversity. And you can see what I can divert. I can define diversity in terms of mutual information, in terms of output from different neural networks. I can also define um, diversity. Let me skip that one. This way, this is a different way of defining diversity. So I'll spend some time on, on this uh, because uh, this is the second slide I want you to remember. Uh, because this is a, the first slide I want you to remember is about the motivation. Why I believe this ensemble approach should be used more often. And then I try to convince you to move away of building the wonderful system. Because that the wonderful system for a lot of real world problems are too complex, too difficult to build. And somehow build a number of smaller things will be better. And this is a key slide uh, in terms of basic ideas. Okay. If I follow your philosophy, you try to build a group of smaller things, collectively they perform one task, it's still one task, either recognition or either sort of pattern classification or in terms of time series prediction. How do I do it? What's the principle in designing these individual neural networks or individual neural systems? So I emphasize that the evolutionary part, which I'm interested in, is actually not the fundamental part. It's a very practical tool I can use. Uh, the essential concept, uh, two of them, obviously we need to have an ensemble. And secondly, is what I mentioned in terms of diversity. So what I meant in terms of diversity? Okay. Let's say we have an ensemble of neural networks, so a group of neural networks. I'm going to define the error functions for the eyes neural network. Yeah. Okay, so this is a typical way uh, in terms of uh, neural computation. Uh, in this equation, uh, this uppercase N is, means a uh, number of training patterns I have in this training data set. Now uh, this D of N means the desired output, so the teacher information for the nth uh, training example because of the supervised learning I'm considering. Uh, F of I here means the current network output for the I's neural network. Okay, so if you take a difference and then square it and then divide it by A, say, oh, that's mean square error. Okay, so that's, a, that's an error term, so there's a network output, design output, square it, so mean square error. So there's nothing special. Something different <coughs> we put it in is the second term. The second term, the first one, uh, for the time being, uh, let's ignore it. It's, it's a parameter, uh, a mountain parameter. And this P, uh, the reason I use this note notation P is to remind me this is a penalty term. What do we penalize? Well, now you can look at this one again. So what's this one? Well, this, this actually is some kind of error, so you can this error. And this is error for anything which is not the same as i. So this is actually for the uh, i's neural network's error. Uh, this is actually the error by other neural networks within the same ensemble. Uh, this multiplication is just like a correlation. And so where does this network correlation come? A network correlation says, I want to minimize this error, obviously. I actually want to minimize this part. I want to minimize this. 
to me, as ask, well, why do you want to minimize this? Well, the message behind this formula is actually very simple. All it says is, if we look at this particular training pattern, assuming I make a big mistake, I is the I's neural network, I want to encourage the rest of this ensemble, this part, not to make the same mistake, because that's how you minimize this correlation. So this is actually a, a very important notion of how I define diversity. Diversity means I don't make the same mistake at the same time. This correlation term does not say I cannot make a mistake. All it says, I do not want to make the same mistake at the same time. So if for a given pattern, I want a very large term there, I want this one to be very small. Actually, I want that one to be negative to this one. The other way around. If I can get this one to be negative, by summing these two together, this error will be small. Uh, it's very intuitive in terms of uh, how you uh, define this uh, diversity. So you, you don't make the same mistake at the same time, and then you can Im immediately imagine when I combine things together, there is opportunity for this combination to perform better than any single individual. Um, so the next few slides, I, I won't go through it, uh, I think I have one easier, yeah, okay. So the previous one described demotivation, uh, obvious question is uh, how do you know that intuitive idea is going to work? And it must, you do offer some explanation. In this case, it turns out, if we look at regression problems, and then we define this as a mean squared error. You can do a decomposition uh, quite rigorously to decompose that mean squared error term into three terms. One is called the bias, the variance, and the covariance. So the derivation you followed is very similar to Gamma and the Gamma's method in 92, because they did a similar decomposition into the mean square error into bias and variance for a single learner. So the difference is we now extend this work by adding a covariance term because it's a collection of the one networks. So theoretically, it says this natural correlation learning, it really tries to minimize this covariance, this term. Um, then you say, well, what's so special about it? There's something. Uh, a little bit special because the bias term, uh, if you look at the formula with a square on it, so no matter how you minimize it, you, you get to zero, but it, it cannot be negative. A variance term is the same, there's a square. Out of it, you get some minimum, you can get zero. Covariance is the only term here, you can actually get the negative sign. If you can get a negative sign, just by observation, you can see, oh, that's a wonderful strategy to minimize mean square error. If I make this term, if I make this term to be very, very negative, then that entire error will be reduced. Right? That's precisely the uh, uh, theoretical justification behind it. Uh, then immediately you probably will say, oh, well, then you find this a magic solution to learning now, right? All you need to do is minimize these covariance, make them very negative, and then uh, all others will lose their jobs because there's nothing else to do. Uh, the world is not that ideal because uh, there is an inherent dilemma there. Whenever we try to make this covariance to be very negative, uh, inevitably, either variance or some of those variance and bias will increase. So there's a balance uh, which has to be struck. How do we achieve this? Uh, there's no sort of theoretical theorem there. It's sort of uh, more like empirical experience. And then you can actually see for all those problems where negative correlation learning has achieved fantastic results, are the cases where this covariance becomes very negative, but corresponding increase in bias and the variance are quite small. And you can exactly see when it's very useful, when it's not very useful. Um, so one slide uh, following on from that important one is 
this particular formula I presented here is an empirical formula in the sense that uh, you can change the exact definitions in this part and this part as long as you follow a single principle. The first one must be an estimation of the error of this i's neural network, and those must be the estimation of error for the rest of the sample. How you estimate it, you can plug in your favorite stuff into it. Now I'm going to give you uh, one example to illustrate. Uh, yeah. So one example to illustrate what happens if you impose this negative correlation into a normal uh, supervised learning. So I pick up one example data set where most people in this field are quite familiar with as this uh, credit card assessment problem. So what I did was the following. Um, okay. I show the results here in terms of omega 1 to omega 4. So those are the testing results again. So I train this neural network uh, ensemble uh, as everybody does. If you ask me how to train it, I can define four neural networks in this group. And then I apply the error function as I just described to you. And then apply normal backpropagation algorithm to you because the second term into the penalty is differentiable. So you actually don't have to do a lot of work, you can just modify the code you have. And then you train all four neural networks simultaneously. I think that's a key word, don't train them one by one simultaneously. Okay. After the training, then I'm going to evaluate both individual neural network performance and ensemble performance because I want to see the relationship between the two. And omega 1 indicates I have a testing data set in order to estimate generalization ability of this trained neural network. Out of 172 cases, the first neural network got 146 correct. So if you divide this uh, number by 172, you get this uh, type of accuracy in terms of uh, testing performance. Similarly, omega 2 means the performance of the second neural network. If you look at the first row, you can quickly see all these numbers divided by 172. The accuracy will be quite similar. It won't be a huge difference in terms of number. However, what I'm interested in is ask question. Are they actually doing the same job in terms of classification in this case? So this omega 1, 2 is really to say, okay, I have a set of correctly classified patterns, I have another set of correctly classified patterns. What are the overlap of these two sets? Although these two numbers are very similar to each other, if you look at the overlapping set, they're actually larger. Uh, overlap the overlapping set is actually smaller, so it's only 137. So that's the first hint you get is percentage-wise, they are very similar, but they are actually doing different things. Okay? Otherwise, you won't really get 137. You can look at it even more closely, <coughs> ask the question, out of these four neural networks, which is the subset to its overlapping? So the subset overlapping, among all four is 128. So you get another 20 examples which are different, although all the percentage wise they're quite similar. So why is such a difference there? Well, that's precisely what is natural correlation learning tries to encourage all these individuals saying, please do different things. Okay, do not do the same thing. You might not believe what I said, which will be very good. Don't believe. Anybody says, uh, you can always argue, well, you know, 128 is not that different from 146, right? So maybe that negative correlation learning is not really working because uh, if it's really working, that overlapping set will be close to zero. It's very different. You will not get zero in that case uh, for a very simple reason. So formula is sometimes quite useful. 
So objective correlation learning is talking about the second term. And the first one is also very important. So basically, the learning task saying that you need to do the job, learn a task, but learn it differently. You cannot just look at the second one to be different, then you forget what you need to do. So. So that's what these uh, uh, experimental results try to illustrate how that theoretical framework actually works uh, in practice. So that's the uh, second part I want to go through in terms of basic ideas. And the last part, uh, when I skip over these slides, uh, this is okay, I, I don't think you lose anything. Uh, it's really just more details to convince you uh, this thing actually worked as expected. And the last part is a collection of the algorithms uh, which try to answer questions primarily from practitioners. In the previous illustration, I said I have a four neural networks in this example. I'm sure if you say, if I'm going to use this strategy to solve my problem, uh, how, how do I know it's four? Why, why not three? Why not five? So there's a, immediately there's a practical question. How you determine the number of neural networks in our sample? So the first algorithm we come up with, again, is using my background in evolutionary computation. Actually, you can use evolutionary algorithm to determine the number of neural networks in our sample automatically. So you don't have to, have to guess or do experimental results for that. And the algorithm is actually quite straightforward uh, using the idea in evolutionary computation called the speciation. So you measure the form of species within the population automatically. Uh, so the number of species will be equivalent to the number of samples in the population. And the second the algorithm tries to answer the question, OK, now I know how to determine the number of neural networks in ensemble. But how do I design individual neural networks? Should they be the same or should they look different? Uh, for individual neural network, how do I decide the number of hidden nodes? So this is the second work actually says we can use some kind of constructive method to construct individual neural network. And that constructive method can also give us a heuristic information when to stop constructing a neural network and then where we should add a different neural network. When we add a new different neural network, we start growing and constructing as well. So it depends on some kind of uh, heuristic information based on the statistics that we collected in the learning process. So that issue can be resolved if you are interested in actually using the algorithm uh, without using this trial and error process. <coughs> Uh, and the last thing in terms of uh, useful algorithms uh, is the notion of uh, multi-objective learning. And this is actually uh, a subfield in machine learning becomes uh, quite popular in the last few years. If we look at this formula uh, closely, uh, all of you can observe that, that yes, in terms of learning, we have at least two objectives. Uh, one is to minimize error. The other one is some kind of regularization term. In this case, it's actually minimizing the complexity. Those two objectives actually conflict with each other because if you have a very large system, it's actually quite easy to learn to minimize the error. In the worst case, you can just memorize all the training patterns. You get a training error from zero, but it's a terrible system in terms of generalization. Uh, on the other hand, you can have a learning system which is very simple, like one linear node, <coughs> always give you constant output. It's very good in terms of complexity, but it's useless in terms of uh, this error. We can actually explicitly use two objectives in the learning process. So that's quite different from an ordinary learning. You look at one objective which minimizes some kind of cost. And the benefits of using this multi-objective approach is it always give you a set. The solution to a multi-objective problem is a set, it's not a single point. 
If the set is wonderful for me because I'm looking at an ensemble approach, there's always question people saying, where do you get that ensemble? And then my answer is, if you use this multi-objective approach, you will get the set, and that set is my ensemble. So why would that set be appropriate? Because in multi-objective learning, you look at a set which is diversely distributed along the parietal front. And that diverse notion is exactly what I'm looking for if it's an ensemble learning. So we don't have to use this natural correlation algorithm we use, which I so sort of conveniently tell you not to worry about parameter lambda, which takes a lot of time to get it right uh, in, in practice. Um, I think that would be okay. So the few slides I skipped over again is about the detailed algorithm improvements. So if an ensemble is too large, you can just prune it. And there's another thing I skipped over saying, although I stand here, wave my hands, saying these ideas can be implemented. Some of these ideas, especially in terms of multi-objective approach and ensemble pruning, you can actually find a very nice Bayesian explanation to say why this is the right thing to do. Not only from your intuition, also from a Bayesian learning's point of view. So to conclude, uh, combining uh, evolutional computation uh, with ensemble learning is actually quite interesting, but certainly uh, very interesting to me, and I hope I convince you, at least partially, you might want to look at it, uh, just because uh, different learning paradigms has different <coughs> characteristics. Uh, if we understand those characteristics, find them together, somehow get something which is actually not doable in either case. Um, secondly, uh, we look at this uh, idea in terms of using natural correlation learning to capture the notion of diversity and then having this ensemble learning based on natural correlation learning. The mathematical derivation I mentioned in terms of decomposition is applicable to <coughs> regression problems, so you can actually derive very nicely for classification problems. Um, there's no mathematical explanation yet, but in practice, we still use it anyway. So we still apply natural, natural correlation learning to solve classification problems, but the theory is not there yet. So if any one of you is interested in this, <coughs> Uh, lastly, it's right, really try to link what I'm talking about here in uh, natural correlation learning to some other topics uh, in the same domain, uh, all related to ensembles. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of boosting, bagging, uh, mixture of experts uh, nowadays, it's random forest. They're all in the same category. Uh, different methods have different advantages and disadvantages. And then for me, obviously, I'm self-interested interest to say this natural correlation learning probably is easier to use than others. I can give you the reason uh, why. Um, yeah, I mentioned this last bit already. So it works for regression problems, not quite theory for classification, it's not, not quite clear yet. But apply. It's okay. So I stop here, I still have a few minutes for others asking questions. I don't know what Thank you very much.